Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Wednesday, October 23rd. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris, Trevor May here with you. Welcome back, Trevor. How are you doing? I am good. Rested and ready to go. <laughs> Relatively rested. Well, congratulations on the new addition to your family. We're glad to have you back on this episode. We're going to rank the relievers on the World Series rosters. Yesterday, we went through the process of ranking the pitchers we expect to see as starters. We're going to dig into a few critical matchups that could swing the series as well, which kind of ties into how we would rank these relievers. There might be a couple of vulnerabilities that each of these lineups can exploit if the right situations arise. So a lot of tactical talk, a lot of reliever talk on this pod. Um, some sad news, though, as we get started today, we learned on Tuesday the passing of Fernando Valenzuela. He passed away at the age of 63, a Dodgers legend who brought Fernando Mania in 1981, won the Rookie of the Year and Cy Young Award that same season, six-time All-Star, uh, and a guy that was a huge influence on the Latino community in L.A., brought a ton of fans to the ballpark. I think that was a huge part of it. Also put his home country really on the map as a place where big league players were going to come from going forward, too. So massive impact, big loss in, in not only just the Dodgers community, but in the baseball community as well. If a lot of folks don't know, Fernando Villanueva also was part of that broadcast crew since 2003 with legendary announcer Jaime Harin, too. So a huge part of the Dodgers organization. I feel like jealous that I missed out on Fernando Mania because it sounds like something that would happen today and get kind of like overused in social media and SEO optimization, but was actually just a larger than life sort of phenomenon when it happened back in the eighties. I, I agree. I love that stuff. I mean, that's what would have made those types of things. Uh, these, these bigger than life, you know, characters in the game was what made me love it so much. Um, it, I also attribute that to like why I love movies so much. I'm a big hero's journey underdog, you know, grind your way to the top. Cream always rises to the top type of guy. And um, like, I would have just ate that up. He probably would have been my, I would, he would have been a, I would have loved him. Um, and every single time something like that happens, uh, I get excited. But uh, like you said, it does get a little like, is this a real thing? Or are we forcing this to be a thing now? And it's, that's not as fun anymore. And also I'm going to, I'm a grown up <laughs> and things get a little bit less magical, but uh, I, I just, yeah, it's something that, you know, it would be nice to have not have social media and, and relive that kind of uh, word of mouth, you know, legendary status that happened. Um, that would, that's really cool. I also just love that uh, it's not came out of nowhere, but you know, it's like, this like we have this such this pipeline of baseball america top 100 lists and all this like sort of fascination with prospects so i, I bet you to some dodgers fans and to some people this was like who's this kid you know and then to win the cy young and the rookie of the year in the same year no one's ever done that and to, for him to do that cy young to me a lot of times is like the oscars where like you have to actually have your oscar winning performance a couple times before you win the Cy Young, you know, like you kind of have to get into the group that people consider possible Cy Young. No, he was just like, no, nah, I'm here. I give it to me. And, uh, you know, some of the things that kind of, you might look at his strikeout rate that year and be like, ah, eight K nine, you know, you know, in our years that's, but that was 1981. So if you actually look at the plus stats, which are like, um, the, you know, what was his strikeout rate relative to the league? Uh, it's a top 40. That's a top 40 strikeout rate relative to his league uh, in the history of, of baseball. And it comes uh, in his rookie season. And it's, you know, the people ahead of him are all Randy Johnson, Nolan Ryan, Pedro Martinez. Pedro Martinez 2002 is the one that's tied with him. Um, and it's it's a ton of Nolan Ryan and uh, Roger Clemens and Randy Johnson. So, um, you know, it may not look like a Nolan Ryan strikeout rate. It may not look like a Pedro Martinez strikeout rate, uh, but it was. And it was such a glorious time. There was, you know, like a, a two-month streak where he gave up like three runs. You know, <laughs> it's like, Again. can you imagine just, it's like, it's like Skeens, but, but there's an element of like, who is this guy? As opposed to with Skeens, we're all like, saw it coming, like, where's Skeens? Why, why isn't Skeens up yet? You know, <laughs> where's Skeens? Why isn't Skeens better? 
How, how did this yeah. happen? Why did Skeens give up a run yesterday? Like the, <laughs> the expectations are completely different in today's day and age, of course, with all the information we have uh, at our disposal. Uh, Dodgers are going to honor Alan Vela prior to the start of game one at Dodger Stadium on Friday. So let's start with the reliever rankings today. Let's dig into these because there's, I think, a lot of weight being placed on both bullpens. The Dodgers more so than the Yankees because they've been bullpenning at times just to get up to this sixty percent of their outs. Yeah, have been it, from the bullpen. It's much more than anyone would have anticipated back when the season began. They've done this at times in the past and had success doing it. But we've wondered with every team that does this: Are there diminishing returns as each round gets more difficult? As each matchup you face has more quality bats in the lineup against you? Is there going to be decay? Is there going to be fatigue? I think all those questions are real. And the way I wanted to frame this question was, how would you rank these relievers just based on everything we have to account for right now? Recent workloads, uh, maybe injuries guys could be coming back from for some guys that may end up on the roster. If we get to a point where series is on the line for either one of these teams and you need someone to come in and just get the last three outs. And let's assume it's the top of the opposing lineup that you're going against. So no no easy path out. Of all the relievers in this series, Trevor, who do you want taking the ball to finish out a game in this series? I will go at this moment, probably Blake Trinan, just because of the the way that the lineups are set up and the the type of repertoire he has versus the other way around mm. um i think just how it matches up it's really close between Trinan and weaver at the moment for me just because uh of the way he he uses his changeup and how that's the best against otani and bets but um trying has been really really good and he's just like he's like a magician watching this ball flies out of his hand is Crazy, and then he's had he's had the experience. He has the experience over Weaver, so uh, I'll just give him a slight edge. And he's thrown really well lately. So, um, and he's thrown lots of strikes. Uh, Phillips is walking a little bit too many guys, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, I'll go with I'll go with Blake Trinan. Yeah, I think the, one of the keys for the top end relievers in the series is going to be getting lefties and righties out. Naturally, yeah. it, it always is, and part of that's because you're not getting that much of an advantage relative other lineups because the elite hitters in both of these lineups handle lefties and righties really well so you have to be good as a reliever against hitters on both sides because you're facing some of the absolute best hitters on the planet you know are you taking trinan in that same situation that i described for trevor one thing that makes me a little bit nervous is that he throws a sinker and so i'm kind of looking for the best four seamer because i do think that fastball will play better against both hands just like you're talking about so for me, I think the uh, decision between the best two is actually between Kopech and Weaver. Uh, those are the two best four seamers in this postseason, and they're nasty. They're at their froggiest. They're looking pretty good. Weaver's, you know, a little bit more overused or over. I don't know what the word is. Just been used more. Has been used for more outs. You know, has. Um, has pitched more <clears throat> maybe running up against you know that first time as a reliever you're like wow this is different than starting you know like this is his first full year as a reliever you know with that schedule maybe he's maybe there's a little bit of like you know there was you know the end of that guardian series there was a little bit of like oh wait this is, he seems a little bit more hittable than he has you know for most of the season but i'm going to give it to weaver over kopech because kopech is still pretty wild and we saw that with his opening sequence uh, in that final game that you can wait him out a little bit. You can you can go to the, you know, and I, Adam Ottavino has talked to me about this where it's like, you know, there's a difference between, you know, he had, Adam said his worst season was the season in which batters came to the, to the plate and said, I don't need to be aggressive. I need to wait. He needs to throw me a strike before, before I sort of wake up. Like he, I'm going to wait till he, he makes me swing as opposed to the best years of Adamino's careers were when people came to the plate and said, I need to be aggressive and get to the fastball before I get that breaking ball. So that whole idea of swinging, and I think with Kopech, maybe, you know, um, these pretty patient Yankee hitters uh, can wait him out. I could in particular see 
Kopech versus Soto um, being an interesting matchup where Soto's like, nope, nope, nope. Oh, that one was actually, you know, four inches lower than you wanted it. And I just hit it out, even though it was super nasty. So I'm going to take Weaver. I love that change up because it, 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 he can throw it to both sides. He's throwing the cutter more and he has the best or second best four seam uh, in, the, in the group of players that we're looking at. Yeah, those were the two I was kind of stuck on. I think Trinan's effectiveness against lefties was something that put him over the top for me for the top spot. But I think it's one, two, Trinan, Weaver for me. The concerns you outlined about Kopech are very real. And here's the the broader question before we kind of get into a few more names. When you see a chart of the Stuff Plus numbers for this year's World Series teams, we've got it up on YouTube if you're actually watching. But These are their postseason Stuff Plus only. It's a snapshot of where they are right now. I think that's probably the better way to do it at this point. I mean, you mentioned Weaver's workload of guys who've been used as relievers this postseason. He's worked the most. He's recorded the most outs now. Cade Smith was number two. But both of these lineups, both the Yankees and the Dodgers, are so good at making swing decisions that I think bad command is more problematic now than it is at any point in the season mostly because of who these teams are. This happens every year every, anyway, but I think it's even more extreme given this matchup. Yeah, and I think despite Trinan's relatively lackluster stuff, plus the you know the one-on-one location plus and the overall uh, pitching plus being good, um, I would have him right, uh, right around. Uh, I think I'd rather have him after Kopech, honestly, because I want that stuff. I would just want, I would tell him, throw it close to the zone and just try to blow it by them rather than uh, be super fine. I don't think that's really going to work. Um, and so I, I have Trinan fourth. So it's basically uh, Weaver uh, third. Weaver, Kopech, Trinan third. Yeah. But the fourth third. spot. The fourth spot. See, the th- what's interesting here is that I think the the even if I give the Yankees the number one reliever, you start to see the Dodgers' depth because I'm going to go Kopech, Trinan, probably Phillips. You know, I'm going to go three Dodgers in a row before I get to a Yankee. The key with Phillips is both his location plus isn't above average on this one. I think it's because he has to be fine with the sweeper against lefties, and so he's willing to walk a lefty because he doesn't want to put that sweeper in the happy zone. And in particular, I circle this matchup, Evan Phillips, against both lefties and righties, just Evan Phillips against the Yankees. This may not be the Dodgers' best look. I found that the Yankees were top 10 in terms of uh, whiff rate and having a good whiff rate, slugging uh, most, most outputs for lefties and righties against sweepers. So... And I and the the search that I did was sweepers with more than fourteen inches of sweep. So this isn't just like blah sweepers or all sweepers. This is closer to Phillips level sweepers. The Yankees are pretty good at them. They see them pretty well. Soto's going to see that sweeper. I think you want to keep Phillips away from Soto. So now we're dwindling the number of pitchers you want Soto to see. <laughs> so you know who do you pitch against Soto, especially if Alex Vesey is not in there. If who do you pitch against Soto is going to be a big uh, problem for the for for the Dodgers. If they had Vesia, man, that would be. They just need him. That's what you want. That's a yeah. That's a big deal. Um, I agree with that full, full heartedly. I mean, um, I have Trine and then Weaver. I would say I would probably go with two more Dodgers uh, with uh, Kopech and then Phillips. Um, Mm -hmm. Kopech just because of pure. You know, pure stuff. Uh, you know, his the thing that 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 he does. He has a little bit of a tendency, and I, I went and looked into this. The same, similarly to like uh, a guy like Ryan Stanek, who has also very very good stuff. Is when they when things aren't fully like things can snowball on them fairly quickly. I think they both haven't really found that like lockdown for a you know ten straight outings in a row. They're really good for eight, and then they have a couple just where they're just nowhere near. And in the playoffs, it's something that gives me a little bit of pause with Kopik, but he does have the best stuff out of anybody in any of the bullpens. And so that's just going to make him a weapon. And then also with Vesia gone, I think that his four seam against Soto is um, your best option. They're going to go to that a lot. Even like Banda, who's the lefty, he's sinker slider. Like that's not going to be as good against Soto as you think. Like sinkers are just, he loves them. So it's, it's, 
um, I would say I would put Kopik, and then I throw Phillips just because uh, he's going to be interchangeable. And if that sweeper is on, maybe not having uh, uh, I don't know what happened my camera there. My my, my bad. I'll fix that. Um, <laughs> but not having you know uh, not Soto per se, but I think Stanton and Judge if his sweepers on even if they see it well and, and are not chasing it off the plate, if he can get it in the zone and then get it off the plate, it's just one of those pitches that you're just not going to, no matter how disciplined you are, if he's dialed in, it's just not hittable and he's going to be deployed against them. Who are the other two guys that need to really not beat you? So if he can keep them and even Glaber Torres to an extent. So like the four of the three of the first four guys, Evan Phillips will be the guy they want to face at times. And so I think that just puts him uh, a little bit above another Yankees guy, which it's close, but, if I'm going to go to the Yankees, um, there's going to be a couple of them next. Yeah, I think the problem the, with Phillips is a lot of the Yankees, even though they haven't seen him much, collectively have had a ton of success. I mean, the one guy Phillips has eaten up is a guy that hasn't even taken a plate appearance yet. It's Trent Grisham. Like, Trent Grisham's <laughs> 0 for 8 with 5Ks, and that's factored into an overall lefty. number, an 1137 ERA for Evan Phillips against current Yankees. And that's with wow. an 0 for 8 from Trent Grisham in there. So, there are a lot of difficult matchups for Phillips in particular. It, it does make me wonder if his arsenal just does not work as well in this spot, and that leaves the Dodgers in a tricky, at least a tricky spot if they need multiple appearances against the heart of the order. Like if they can only yes. use him maybe one time through <clears throat> the top three or two through four hitters and then say, okay, we burned Evan Phillips one time. We're not going to give them multiple looks at him because they match up so well against him. Yeah, here's the here's what's so difficult about the modern game. So, you know, I'm writing about a pitching plan for for this series uh, that's going to come out on Friday. And what we found recently is that the third time you see a reliever is almost worse in a, in a single series. It's almost worse than the third time you see a, pit, a starting pitcher in one game. Batters have an 800 OPS the third time they see a reliever in a series. That's way too high. That is that is huge. That's higher even than what lefties hit off of righties, you know, with the platoon advantage given in the regular season. Like this is 800 is a big number. When you see that, that's almost like when we talk about Trevor, like when you see 60% tendency, you're like, whoa. So 800, you're like, what is that? Like, I don't want my reliever, like, especially if you're talking about Soto and Judge, you, you don't want, even if you think Evan Phillips is good against Stanton and Judge, I agree. You kind of don't want to get in that 800 period. Like you don't want to have Evan Phillips come up game six or game seven on the line. And it's like the fourth time the judge has seen him, you know, like I think then you're like, oh, he's he's seen this. He's been he's been practicing. He's had the traject going like he, he's 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 about ready to take one of these. So. <clears throat> the the difficulty is with the way we're using the bullpens, you need to get through the heart of the order twice in your wins. So that's eight times in in four wins, right? And let's say you have a close game, you lose. Maybe that's five games where you want to use your A bullpen. So that's now 10 times that you need to see Soto. And you need to get him out 10 times. Yeah. So you, you And you don't want to use the same guy three or four times. So you're like, this is a math problem. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. so for Stanton and Judge, I fully agree that Alvin Phillips is one of the, is, you know, you can get them out maybe three times, maybe three times with Evan Phillips. Then Michael Kopeck, six. You're <laughs> still missing like Trying three to, to four. Gonna close and yeah, like somewhat. So know. it's, that's why, I, that's why I think Daniel Hudson is also a big one. That's a big deal. I think I put him after Evan Phillips. I like Tommy Conley. Um, I, I like, who's the, uh, who's, uh, I like Clay Holmes actually. Um, but Daniel Hudson has been throwing three miles an hour faster in the postseason than he did in September. <laughs> and I thought something's wrong with Daniel Hudson and he's become, uh, if you look at this, the stuff plus list, he's got one twenty three stuff plus in the playoffs just behind him Phillips. He's super huge. Cause he's that other righty. He's that third righty. That's going to get in there. Uh, and then you use Ryan Brazier, I think, as like, a, you know, to try and keep everyone from three. So th those are your four righties that you're going to use against Stanton, the judge. And you're going to and you're, you you want to use Brazier last. 
you know, it's a it's a it's a mix and match thing. So I think the next part of the ranking that's tough is Hudson versus Holmes and um and uh and Conley. Mm-hmm. I think they're all decent. They're all pretty good. I'm a little are you at all nervous, Trevor May, that um Tommy Conley has gone to one hundred percent change ups in the last series? So there's one interesting thing about that, and we I talked about it the other day, uh you know, on, on my show that like, everyone's like, how can you get away with throwing that many changeups in a row? Now we understand like the Lance McCullers curveball, like a curveball is a, you know, it, it or the breaks so cutter, much. Right. Yeah. Or like a, a weird moving pitch that you can throw all the time. Um, but like a changeup, like once you know a changeup's coming, you're supposed to be able to dial it in. Uh, the thing is though, his variation, well, so I went and looked the variation of his, of his, uh, uh, vertical on the pitch has been all over the place so sometimes he's throwing like a true two seam and sometimes he's throwing a straight up splitter um and it's the same below uh the nice thing is too about that is as you get used and the more pitches you throw fatigue affects the change up the least um you know your spin goes down great uh below goes down great uh (laughs) it moves more great uh it's just command at that time so that there is but like you against the guardians uh, the Dodgers are a different team. Uh, Mookie, you can't just sit there and go change up, change up, change up, change up to Mookie Betts and get him get himself out all the time. So he's going to be limited as well. However, I will. There's this other side of things which actually puts Canley higher than Clay Holmes for me, is mm-hmm. because uh, Mookie Betts is his worst pitch from righty is by far the changeup. It's not. That like, was what he, we used in the how to get Mookie Betts out second yeah, we did. He hammer sliders and. And sinkers and Clay Holmes throws only those two pitches. And if he can't mm-hmm. locate his sinker, he's feeding one of the best slider hitters ever sliders. And he has no other options. Canley at least can throw a pitch that he doesn't handle as well, even when he knows it's coming. Same thing with Otani. Otani hits sliders and fastballs, uh, sinkers and and sl- depth sliders like what Clay Holmes throws better than he hits changeups overall. Mm-hmm. I mean, he hits everything hard. But again, it, but it comes down to, are they just going to sell out for the pitch or not? And how much does that have effect with it? I just think his repertoire, the same way that uh, Weaver is a fastball, he's got a cut or two, but his change of a fastball, four seam are his bread and butter. Those things line up against those two guys much better mm. than say uh, um, the other way around with, so with sliders against the Yankees, I'd say the changeups for the, for the, uh, or sorry, the changeups for the Yankees against the Dodgers might have a better chance of neutralizing the guys that you don't want to beat you better than the other way around um but they also have thrown more so there's a how rested will they be they've had five days off so you know that should get you good but then again your brain might say hey man it's the off season that happens sometimes we are like rusty as hell when you come back you're like what's going on it's because your body's like hey man we're supposed to be on the flight home like what are we what are we doing here <laughs> uh so it'll be interesting to see but i will say i will say can't i would put canely even above uh the the heavy play homes um but it does concern me. He's gonna have to throw a fastball to to the Dodgers. You're just not gonna be able to do that the same way, or at least doesn't seem like at the usage he's had. You're not gonna be able to do it three, two, three days in a row. You're gonna have to right, be right. a different guy one of these days. So, yeah, I, mean, I think you. I, one thing that you just said that was uh, really fascinating that I don't think I've ever noticed before is I do think maybe he has two different changeups. Yeah, I mean you're he talking might. about the variance on the changeups. He, it almost looks like there's a different cluster on a Savant page. If you just look at the top of his Savant page, they now have this movement profile. It almost looks like there's a different cluster of changeups that's about four inches less ride uh, than the other cluster of changeups. Yeah. So I, I he, wonder. He throws, a Vulcan. he throws the middle, the split in the middle fingers, like the you know, uh-huh. top. Um, and he might split his fingers out farther. It, you can tell when he taps. Like some of them are really, really split. He's like trying to turn it into a split change, and then the other one might be a little bit more restraint. More he's like trying a, to get a strike or something. Like he's a little first more hit. like a sinker. Yeah, more a little like bit. A sinker, so the like, closer your fingers are together, the more you're going to put force on the ball. That's like yeah. more like like a sinker. Like you're going to put more velo on the ball. So it's going to be more harder velo, and straighter. It'll be a little bit more true. So you, you're yeah, it won't be like dropping off the table. It'll be more gradual. You'll be able to command it a little bit better, but it's still his change up, and he's got such good feel. I just don't think he's that confident in his fastball either right now. His velo has just kind of done this all year um and he's used to throwing 98 so that sometimes happens as well but when you got it and it's working go go for it i guess Mm -hmm. 
One question yeah, I, mean, I, I like I like you. maybe Holmes a little bit ahead just because I think people are going to pound that great thing to the ground. Like they may make contact, mm-hmm. but I think I think with all the seamship of wake, he's the seamship wake god when it yeah. comes to that sinker. I think that no matter how many times you put that on traject, I don't I don't know that the traject can nail seam shifted wake. You know, like that's a pretty yeah. that's a really fine, precise thing to ask of it. And um, and it also has to do a little bit with deception of how the ball comes out, how the ball's spinning. Um, and how it moves and how the looks out of the hand and the traject can't really it doesn't give you ball out of hand because it can't it has to spit out of a hole at some point so i i think that you know to some extent clay holmes is still like a, a little bit of an ace in the hole where he's go. like you, you got two guys on base you got some righties coming up you know throw clay holmes and try to get that ground ball he's a little bit like tyler rogers on the giants where like it's a little bit frustrating as a closer because people make contact you know, because they, you know, you want more yeah. swing and miss. Um, but it's really good as like an eighth inning guy or a guy who can come on with b- people on base and in this like sort of old school, like I need a double play kind of yeah. idea. So yeah. I do have both those guys right around Hudson. I think that's a really hard group to, to, uh, to separate. Each of them has their own strengths. The other thing that I would use Conley for, uh, is it, is it Canley? It's Canley. Canley. Yeah. The other thing I'd use Canley for is, you know, when you're talking about the lefties, the way I was talking about the righties, and you know, you have to get them out ten times or whatever. You know, um, <clears throat> I think you've got you got a you got a circle uh, Shohei Otani, basically by himself, or Shohei Otani and Max Muncy. Freddie Freeman is a little bit like wait till he's you see what he's doing, but yeah. you, you know they're gonna put Freddie Freeman in between Muncy and and Shohei. So you've got this weird sort of five batter group with you know Shohei at the top and Muncy at the bottom. That's just that's where you're like, oh, what do I do against those lefties? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking about Nestor Cortez, you know, on The Athletic today as, you know, that's his deal. Well, that's his deal. But you, like I said, you don't want Nestor Cortez three times against Otani. Even if you say that's your deal, you're happy if you get it twice. And, you know, the other guy that you're going to use against him is Tim Hill. And Tim Hill, I'm not putting anywhere, you know, near my top guys, but situationally, he's a top oh, yeah. guy. Yeah. And I think Canley has to be in the Otani mix because Agreed. of the changeup. I agree. And so if you're trying to get Otani out. So he could, those, both those guys are good for, for Conley. The, the one nice thing about the Yankees is they have Carlos Rodon. They have a lefty starter. Because that one day, I think Carlos Rodon can take a, an Otani out away from the bullpen. He can go three times against Otani, I think. Because Rodon is so good and he's a lefty. I think he can take one of those uh, 10 from the bullpen. You still got nine you got to get, which means, and you only have Tim Hill, Nestor Cortez, and Tommy Canley. And so, you know, if you're really going to get to 10 times getting Shoei Otani out and wins, each of those guys is going to see him a third time. Uh And uh, I think, you know, a lot of people will be on the edge of their seats when those things happen. Yeah, I, I had the the Rodon versus Otani as one of my like really important matchups because of the lack of a power lefty in the Yankees bullpen. You can only if they have Tim Meza on the roster too. We'll see if he's even there. Hill and Meza. You don't want Otani to get multiple looks at those guys. Otani's not bad against lefties, and if you're not throwing hard, especially he sees it one time, he sees it the second time, it's going to be completely different, right? You don't, I don't those, think those guys don't work. Them. Yeah, I don't no. think Mesa would face him even if he is on the roster. He's he's no. there if there's a if blowout either way. He, he yeah, just, you know. So, so he's not I really, think they might throw like how Young was for the for the uh, Mets. Yeah, but the, I, I think, think they lighter. might throw Hill in wins. I think they might throw Hill in no, wins. They, funky I think enough, but they might earn it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Lighter's weird because he's had a reverse split for his career. So yeah, you have this righty finger. that does well against lefties that split finger. That's probably your other guy that you're using at some point in an important spot against Otani and hoping it works out. I don't know how many times you get away with it, but you have to get away with it at least once. Mm-hmm. If you let's say it's sub three times seen, who what's the order that you're using? You know your guys against Otani. Let's say you okay. So is it is it Canley first? So if it's Canley first, you use them twice. Who do you use next to instead of Canley the third time? Hill. Probably Hill so maybe got, once, like if you can once. sandwich too, like if it's like you go Hill and then someone else and then Hill again, if you can get away with it, um, like I'm talking like the next day. So um, Hill lighter? Is it lighter after Hill? Like two games later, maybe, maybe light. So that's the thing. So 
the 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 Cortez. I the thing that was it's interesting is like how is Cortez? How do you want to use Cortez and how do you want to use Strowman if they're on the rock? Like we got to figure out who's where. One of them has to be the bulk inning guy. Like yeah, you, in the fourth Strowman game, will be. Yeah. He's not going to come and face anyone on purpose. He's going to try. They're going to be like, we need three innings. Please go throw mm-hmm. three innings. And he'll. I mean, he's he's the type of guy who's like, I'll give you three. I'll give you four. Like that's so. Mm-hmm. But Cortez maybe. Then again, elbow inflammation. Do we want to throw him four times? Like, can he be effective four times? And he's a lefty that could figure in on our Otani, Otani plan, you know? Yeah, so. maybe we start him against Otani. Try to bring him in against Otani in, like, the fourth if the starter and the game's tied, and then try to get him around to face him again. Um, mm. That that I could see that happening. Or does Aaron Boone just go, Clay Holmes is our guy, man. He's got to go get him out. He's got to. <laughs> he has to because he's our one of our best three relievers. Um, but the interesting thing to me, and we meant, just mentioned it, and I know we, we're going to talk a little bit more about our straight-up matchup, but lighter is a very interesting thing, especially with how the last couple games uh, against Guardians went and how how he did his job and did it well um, after being called on, after not being on the roster and being called on to do it. Um, he's he's going to be really important for me. It's going to be a lot of because the starters just do not go deep into games. Even the Yankees have been the best at it so far. And traditionally, though, they still aren't getting as many innings as they should from their starters. Um, they just... So like that that fifth sixth inning like turnover is going to be just it's going to be the the inflection point for every game like it was in the Mets series in the sixth inning is when the game either got out of hand or it, like it needed to be stopped and the Mets never did it and they kept lo- like kept getting too much distance and were not able to come back at the end of the game I think that that was happening kind of in the Guardians all Stanton hit every homer in the sixth inning so it's like that is going to be the most important inning in the games fifth and sixth inning are going to be the ones I'm paying attention to the most, and you don't want to go to your three there. So who gets it and who has those like four, five, six guys that do a better job? Um, that's going to be the, I think, what the story of the game, at least what I'm going to pay attention I mean, they're going to be like, Otani and Judge. That's what the media is going to talk about, but I'm going to pay attention to how well are those, the se- how, how well is the second line doing in their bridge uh, duties? Because I feel like outside of Kopech, there's no real like fireman guy. There's no Cade Smith. They can throw in the third and throw in the eighth. Like no one's going to be doing right. That. It's like more of a depthy bullpen than it yeah. is like really. They're still excellent. using That's their like- four through six guys in those bridge spots. They're not using their their setup guy. And if they're trying to get sixty percent outs again from their yeah. bullpen, like that's yes, it's going to be the fourth. It's even going to be the fourth, the fourth, yeah. fifth, and sixth, where where it's going to be like, what are you guys doing? Because you, you and especially if you want to like alternate looks, you can't can't just be like, well, this is our plan. It's always in the fourth we go to this guy, in the fifth we go to this guy, in the sixth we go to this guy. No, then then by the third time they see that, the Yankees be like, oh yeah, we saw these guys in this order before. We're we're cool. That's why I think you want to take those those that third, fourth, fifth <clears throat> relievers and give them one shot each at the highest leverage spot and just say, okay, you got to do it once, and mm-hmm. then you're not going to see them again until maybe the very end of the series. And even that's going to be as situationally optimized as it can possibly be in that situation. That's what I think they are trying yeah. to put together. Right. I wonder if Jake Cousins has a, a couple of important innings in this World Series. He's kind of filthy. He's been hurt a lot. But as far as swing and miss stuff goes, he's got that. I mean, 34.2% K rate in the regular season has the walk issues that I think leave him vulnerable in this sort of matchup. But I I think Jake Cousins, for me, is definitely inside that circle of trust of guys that I'm okay throwing out there against some of the Dodgers' top hitters if I have to. I agree. Yeah, Yeah. I think he's a way to to alternate looks on on righties in particular. He's, you know, if you're doing the old Tampa Bay Rays clock face, you know, he's he's different than almost anybody else on this roster. He's kind of a side army righty sinker slider guy, you know? And, uh, you know, he even has a, a I, I've heard he has a fork ball that he, that he never uses. I doubt that's going to be, we're going to see it the first time in the world series, but that would be pretty awesome. If you do see one, please, please circle it and highlight it for me because I'm waiting for him to throw it. But yeah, even with just the sinker slider, I think he's going to be a, a good weapon against, against righties. I I'd put, I don't know if I'd put him in the top 10, the back end of the top 10 is, is difficult. You've, you got lighter, um, you've got, uh, Jake cousins. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know exactly who I, I fit in there. Uh, lighter has been pitching better in the postseason than they did in the regular season in terms of stuff. 
but worse in terms of locations. And so I don't know if I trust a guy that is so split finger heavy to not walk a bunch of guys. If he walks, you know, two Yankees, that's instant trouble. You know, so I think, uh, you know, I think I might sneak Jake Cousins into my, uh, despite a, a super, uh, inferior stuff plus to, um, to uh, Mark Leiter. I think I might sneak Jake Cousins in my t- in the back end of my 10. Yeah, I, I think he belongs in that group. Nestor is the toughest one to fit in because we don't know for sure if he's on the roster. And then we don't even know on the side if he's stretched out enough to go multiple innings or if he's one inning at a time and we're going to see him in two or three different games. Like that's a great unknown. I think our first assumption was maybe heel and Nestor Cortez tandem in the middle of the series to try and get five, six Getting innings and then them, turn yeah. it over to the A bullpen. If everything goes well, it's a little less than that if it doesn't. Uh, but if if you told me you know, Nestor Cortez is healthy enough to give you as many as six outs on two occasions, then he's probably like a sixth or seventh best reliever overall in the series because of the importance of having a lefty on lefty bridge. matchup and someone better than the likes of, of Hill. Yeah. It's just interesting. He also was hurt. He coming off injury, not having mm-hmm. thrown in games like Sanga. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we just it, saw Sanga do okay and then not, not we just so knew good. it wasn't the same. Yeah. Uh, so it's just like it's just a crapshoot based on how good someone feels. We just don't know. Like if they're just like the adrenaline of the situation, they're like, I'm ready to go because it's the World Series and I want to pitch in the World Series, or if they're truly uh Oh uh, yeah, you can't yeah. even know if you're the Yankees and you haven't throw a bullpen because you're like seeing the bullpen, you're like, ah, oh, it's ninety. I don't know, it looked okay. Yeah. Maybe that's know. ninety and okay in the bullpen, but 93 on the mound in the World Series and just yeah. fine, you know, or it's I, I no, think it's he's still 90. Be, I think he's going to be the first time he goes out there. There's just so many question marks. I really do think it's going to be a stop the bleeding, give us a couple innings, be our long guy at, at first. And but then they try, maybe they, that happens in the game one game. I, we hope not for, for Garrett Cole and for Rodon, but if he has to, they'll know at that point whether or not what, what, but they just won't know until he's in a game. So it's just that's a hard, it's, it's just such a wild yeah, card. It seems like a lot to s- start talking to him. Like you're getting Otani, you're our Otani. We'll get guy. Otani out. He's like, okay, like in, I'll, in game one me. of the World Series, off of injury, like here you go, Cole. Cole's kept them, you know, kept them to one run and five, and you know, we need you against Otani. It's like okay, <laughs> it's, it's a one run game. So given that he's coming off an injury, you'd both choose Tim Hill over Cortez in that situation At early first, in the series yeah, until the we know time. what Nestor has. Yes, and he did. That's yeah, funky he enough too. Last like game, last series too, Tim Hill did. He did. How many he times has Otani seen a Tim Hill type? I, I, funky, you know. man. There's yeah, no one like funky. it. No one else throws the blow. Is there another uh, lefty that is under a ha- sidearm? I don't think there is. Mm. I don't think there another one exists. Like truly low, lower than. Than uh, ninety degrees. I don't. I don't know if there is one. Um, he was. You not. He, he used to be like Strom height, like a little bit higher than the sidearm, and now he's just completely. I'm just going to be a submariner uh, and throw fastballs. So uh, yeah, he's he's. It's one of those things. Like he's so funky that who knows how how Otani's going to you know how that's going to look to him because we know Manaya gave him gave him str- struggles at least in the first outing. Like the guy stepping at him, no matter how good you are. Guy stepping at you and then throwing across his body into the other side of the plate. It's just there's something about it that's that's hard to be on top. But then again, the the guy's a freak, so who knows? So we got I got a little excited about the matchups. Oh, uh, so oh, hey, here I got an answer for for him real quick. Sorry. Yeah. Lowest lefty release points this year in baseball. Tim Hill, three feet off the ground. Second, Hobie Hobie Milner. 4.3 feet off the ground. Yeah, yeah. So he's yeah. the only one. He's a, he's a unicorn. Him and Tyler three is, and, and in terms of like how many times has Otani seen anybody like these guys? Three is Joe Jacques. Four is Rich Hill. Five is JP Sears. Six is Sammy Peralta. I'm now going to put Otani as the batter, and I bet you he hasn't seen any of these guys. The I don't know. Lowest, but I, I can speak to how uncomfortable as a fan you are when uh, Hobie Milner comes into the game, just because it's it's funky, <clears throat> but it looks so hittable. The lowest release point that uh, that that Shoyotani has seen this year from a lefty is Tom Cosgrove with a four point seven eight. Mm. So Tim Hill's going to come in a foot and a half lower 
than the yeah. lowest release point. So I, I I would at least do it once. I think I would do it twice. Depending, I might even, and I'm not like a results based guy, but if the first two went like, you know, Tiny just didn't look like he could see it well, then I might risk a third. But that's to. it. I mean, yeah. it, there's going to be a point where it's going to be like, we just have to do this. Like, I, yeah, I know. I know the numbers, dude, but yeah. what else am I supposed to do here? <laughs> he's, yeah, funky, yeah. he's weird. He's done it the first two times. We have to go off that. It's I'm not weird. throwing Strowman against Otani. Sorry. It's like when you walk Soto <laughs> to get the judge with the bases loaded. We know what usually happens, but it hasn't happened lately. We got to go off this. I, yeah. We have to. There's nothing else to do here. Yeah. Sometimes you get to those points where it's a coin flip decision. So you don't have an easy path or you just are out of options because you've already used someone else. Out of or, options. You know, everyone's hurt. Everyone's all, be a all, hero. No one's, no one's yeah, fresh. Everyone pitched yesterday. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. Here it goes again. All right, so Trevor, your top five was Trine and Weaver, Kopech, Phillips, Keenly, right? So who do you have at the bottom half of your list? Well, how do you round it out? I would throw uh, I would throw Clay Holmes at six, um, and then I will go to just because the only reason that Daniel Hudson seven here for me is just because he hasn't been used that much, um, and I like to think that the, the Dodgers have some thinking behind that because he has been really good. I mean, I know he's a little older. Maybe his stuff's a little diminished, whatever. But he could be the wild card. He could be a guy they lean on. He throws really well, and they just keep going to him. Um, and then Mark Leiter probably goes in there. Tim Hill probably goes in there. And then I think another guy in that realm of like, you know, Yamamoto's from four strong innings, but now we're getting around the thing, and we need a fifth inning guy. I'll throw Anthony Banda in, in at 10, just because he's the lefty. And he's mm-hmm. – I played with Anthony in 2021. I'll, this is just a little personal anecdote. To see the things that he is – the way he has changed and the way he's just bought into like he used to have ride. He used to sit there and just, I think it actually was 28. Was it 2021? Yes, it was. So he talked to Seth Lugo and I constantly about ride and about like, how do you spin your curveball so much? He was super curious and he's trying to get a riding fastball. It looks like he's really bought in. He always had good electric stuff. So to see him being successful like he is and just like buying in and doing what he's do, buying into the thing and being good at it. That's uh, good. But I think that he's, he's a wild card for, we need a lefty to come in and get out. Soto, jam him get a double play uh maybe even rizzo i mean rizzo had six hits in the last series like we don't want we need a guy to come in um who, who knows so i i think you know your lefty is always gonna be important so that's why i throw him a 10. all right you know you went weaver kopech Trannon, phillips hudson and then we get down to six at Holmes. how do you round your list out i'm gonna go canely brazier brazier nice. i think he's gonna be really important uh to Ver- to diversify the looks against the righties um you know he's he he's underrated and he got he was the only uh pitcher that saw a met three times in the mets dodger series the only dodger reliever that saw a met three times other than their mop-up guys was ryan brazier he saw pete alonzo three times and he got him out all three times so <clears throat> I, you know, Pete Alonzo and Aaron Judge, they're, now I'm not saying they're the same guy, but they're both high ball hitters, you know, a little bit, you know, a little bit more weakness down low. You know, there's some similarities there that I'd be like, Brazier is a guy who's going to hopefully get Judge out for me twice. So that alone puts him in my top 10 because I need to, I need to figure out all my Judge outs in there. Um, I'm going to put Hill as the best of the lefties. And that makes me at eight. That gives you um, nine. Nine, nine. That's nine already. Mm-hmm. And I already said I'm I'm sneaking cousins in at ten. The only guy that um, I want to get on this list that I don't right now is is um, Nestor. When I know, you know what his role is, what he is, um, I would have Nestor in this, and I might have him as high as Daniel Hudson. Um, if he was throwing well and especially out of the pen, could he throw 93, you know, out of the pen? It's definitely possible. There's a, a natural segue here of the critical matchups that could swing this series. And I, I just look at, you know, I mentioned the Rodon versus Otani and the importance of him getting through the lineup or at least through Otani a third time in those starts. That's going to be really important. I could see Kopech against Judge being a matchup at some point 
where the command is wobbly. Soto either works a walk or gets on against him. There's traffic. And you get the right on right matchup with Kopech against Judge. And we'll have to see if if he can actually execute, right? That's going to be a spot where I'm like, all right, which Michael Kopech shows up? Because if he's in and around the zone the way he can be, great. No problem. He's going to cruise. If he's throwing non-competitive pitches, then it's a spot where a big inning happens and it's a spot where the Dodgers needed Kopech to work through a jam, right? So I'm looking at that as one of the really important matchups. That's also fascinating because that's strength on strength. Mm -hmm. Judge is a high ball hitter. You know, Kopech is a high fastball guy. Is Kopech going to try and throw like four straight cutters at the knees to uh to Aaron Judge if so and he executes them then he might get the out mm-hmm. but I don't think the cutter is necessarily Kopech's best pitch and what he wants to do is get a strike or two with the cutter and finish you with the four seam and you could he could get to two strikes on Judge and try to finish him with the four seam and that's when he gives up the homer so you know Judge eliminates Kopech's best strength in certain in a certain way, or at least matches it. So that's strength on strength in a way that, you know, Kopech may just say, screw it. I can throw it by this guy. And then Judge says, ah, no, you can't. And that's one of those matchups, too, yeah, batter versus pitcher stats. They're not predictive. They're always <clears throat> tiny samples. I don't know how much they actually mean. I'm curious to get Trevor's thoughts on those a little bit. But Kopech has held Judge to an 0 for 6 with two Ks so far in their previous meetings. And it's not like the Michael Walker thing where it's a long sample and it's right on right changeups that have worked really well. It's typical like reliever versus slugger. It could turn on one bad pitch, right? It's that kind of split. So I, I, I wouldn't put any stock into the success he's had so far, but I'm 99% sure they will mention that on the broadcast. The first time <laughs> Kopech faces judge in the series. I, I mean, you know, uh, Mookie Betts was one for six against me with two, two or three strikeouts. And am I confident? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know what I, mean? like, I feel like I got lucky every single time. He has a single. That's all he has. And he'll, he would be like, no, man, you something about you. And I'd be like, no, no, you're lying. No. Just trying to get no. you your, would, your if we had a seventh, you would hit a homer. <laughs> yeah. And the, the thing about that is Kopech's a, like, you know, he's a the guys. He dominates. They're swing and missing 60 percent of the time. You get two strikeouts out of six at bats. That's not that's not him dominating. Um, and I would like to see the four non strikeouts and what those look like, probably mm-hmm. some flyouts, right? So, um, and again, like you said, it's it's power on power, and but it's like his best, like the way Kopech gets that look in his eye, like here's 101, and I'm only gonna throw this, and that isn't if there's any guy outside of Aaron Judge or not Aaron Judge outside of uh, uh, Juan Soto who that doesn't work on, it's Aaron Judge. He's just like, mm-hmm. you can't, you're not gonna be able to out power me um so that is an interesting one for me too yeah and and you mentioned the 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 interesting thing too now that we see the dodgers in the world series again is how they're the big bugaboo with them lately or the last whatever since they haven't been getting as far into the playoffs is how often they make decisions based on like sample size stuff from this regular season and and they try to put themselves in the best position and and sometimes they make decisions that remove someone's ability to like just step up. Um, I saw this. There's a moment uh, that the Padres did. I think it was game two when uh, um, Morehan walked a guy 2 2. And then it just, they, they intentionally walked bets because they're like, you can't get him out. It's the fourth inning or whatever. And then it was 5 4 after a wild pitch. And then they ended up losing. And I was like, see, that's the type of thing you're like, hey, Adrian, I don't believe that you can get him out even though you're up. It's a 2-2 mm-hmm. count. I don't, and mm-hmm. and that is over-managing in my opinion, just because, yeah, the numbers might say it's right, but that it's not, that's not how we operate here. You gotta, Adrian needs to get him out. He, it doesn't matter if it's not a good matchup. Yeah. He still Maybe has Maybe better to, to send the pitching coach and say, let's, you know, don't give him anything in don't the middle. Don't give in. Like, you can walk him, but, you but know, we, let's, if let's you can get him, out, get him out, great. But what you're guaranteeing yeah. is you're bringing up another, even though he's banged up, another MVP to hit after him. And that's just <laughs> and lefty that doesn't have lefty splits. And Marihan didn't have the lefty, didn't have a huge platoon split either. So it's just like, the numbers actually don't even back this up much. It's just, you're, it's like an emotional. Mm. So it, it's interesting because mm. the Dodgers have done this in the past. So, um, but I, I want to see some guys do something they're not on paper have done before or supposed to be doing that. You know who I'm circling for that is Ben Casparius. 
you know, because he's wild and has great stuff. He's righty and he's going to be put in to a losing game. And he could step up and keep them close while the Dodgers offense tries to cook. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think that there could be a game where Ben Casparius comes in, gets them six outs and keeps them, you know, scoreless. And all of a sudden, you know, it's a tie game again. And the, the A bullpen comes back out. So that would be, that would require some of what you're saying. It's sort of like, Hey, you're a guy Give now. A I know we're, we're down by one or two. Like this isn't, we're not, we're not waving the white towel. We're saying you, we can't use our A, but you are the guy that we, you need to step up now and get these outs. And I think Kasparis could do it. I, I kind of ex- excited about him, in, especially in this role. When he is a starter, he gets a little bit more exposed by his lack of command. But uh, as a reliever, he can simplify his his his, his arsenal and, and kind of really hone in. So he could be he could be an X factor for them. Let's say you're trying to keep it close, and on the Dodgers side, it's Kasparis going against the Yankees. You need, let's say you need three innings to keep keep your team in it. And on the other side, it's Stroman against the Dodgers lineup. Who are you more comfortable with? in that role, trying to get through the opposing lineup once while keeping it close. I kind of like Kasparius because one of the things that we've been learning about is the familiarity, the role of familiarity with shapes and familiarity with relievers. Third time you see a reliever in a series, third time through the order. These are familiarity things. I think every team like the Yankees or Dodgers should have like a Ben Kasparius that they keep in the minors all year and they bring up for the playoffs. Because nobody has a mental book on Kasparius. Who wants to be that guy? <laughs> Let's see some hands. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. I know. Right. Not ready. Yet. High pressure. Sorry, dude. Yeah. We really like you, but we we really want to bring you up in like on September 30th. Is that cool? <laughs> <laughs> we really value you, but really we want you to be that that wild card. Think we think of you as Francisco Rodriguez. Look him up. 2002. That's <laughs> you're our guy. But you know. Everybody has a mental book on Marcus Stroman, dude. Yeah. I mean, I've, everybody on the Dodgers is, I'm, I'm sure, has seen Marcus Stroman at least eight, ten times. And could you, would command you, is this thing we don't know where his command's going to be either. We don't know how fresh he's going to be. So he needs command, like you said, because Ferris <clears throat> can get by with stuff. And I would lean yeah. towards that guy more than I would the command guy that hasn't pitched in a while. You know, you know the only Dodger who's just torched Marcus Stroman is Kevin Kiermeyer. He's seen a lot of Mookie bets. <laughs> it's, it's pitch, a lot of first pitches, huh? Just yeah. Out of his shoes on a sinker. Yeah. 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 So a lot of, lot of Mookie bets, uh, Marcus Stroman matchups that have gone Stroman's way. Wow. Okay. Uh, Freddie Freeman is one for 18 against Marcus Stroman. Well, for his I career. was at least right that they have a huge mental Rolodex. I'm oh, surprised yeah, yeah, that yeah, Stroman's gotten know. the better of them. But, you yeah, know, some of this sure. might have also been earlier career Stroman. Oh, so there's a that, little difference. That's why between... this is all ridiculous. Like, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Ten year big leaguer has seen guys over various points of his career, various points of their careers. Everyone's changed a bunch of times over the span yeah. of that matchup. That's why the matchups are so, so meaningless for me. Any other critical matchups you've got circled, Trevor? Do you got any other spots that you're looking at and saying, okay, this this could be huge if it goes one way or the other? I will uh, I will say this pro- – I'm, I'm banking on this happening w- at least one time, and I think that uh, uh, Clay Holmes is going to have to get through Betts, Freeman, and then Teoscar. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll be really interesting. Multiple times. Yeah, like so the first time that happens, because I'm anticipating this being like a sixth inning, three, two, four, two game. Um, and and I, I really want to see Mookie versus Clay. I want to see how Mookie handles uh or, or how comfortable he looks just because he he can he's so quick at dropping his head on that down and in sinker, and he's so good at hitting sliders, no matter how funky you are. So it's what's left for Clay Holmes if yeah, was like and I I've seen Clay as of late, especially when his command's not great and his sinker's a little up, and he's just like, I have to throw sliders. And mm-hmm. like just where he he looks like he's trapped. He's like, Oh god, I have one, I have one thing right now. And this guy, <laughs> and Mookie's like the best, he's the best slider, right on right slider hitter. I've I, I think we talked about this very early in the season, but just like in terms of not chasing, and then when it is in the zone, just smashing it. Um, uh, you know, he's got what four. And he home can runs pull them, even though the movement's going away from him, right? Oh yeah, he, he goes those. down and gets it, and it's like, yeah. But if it's one inch off the plate, he takes it. You're like, I have yeah. no confidence in this pitch, <laughs> and he doesn't have a lot of. It's it's got more depth 
than a lot. And that's, he goes down and gets stuff down and both of his pitches go down. So um, obviously he's throws really hard and has a hard slider. So like, you know, that's going to factor in, but I think there's going to be a bridge moment where it's going to be very important for him to get Mookie bets out. Um, so I'm in, uh, and I might happen twice. And I think that's going to be a, a po- possible turning points one way or the other. Um, how, so, how, would you call it desperation or uh, wily smart? One thing we found out from Cleveland was they were top two in the league in high sliders, high changeups, right on right changeups. You know, like they were they they are top three in weird. They yeah. love the. It was the Brent Rooker. I don't know if you saw the Brent Rooker retweet of of the Eli Morgan high changeup. Yeah, that came back in and he was like, your brain cannot make you swing at this. So would it be weird or desperate if you see Clay Holmes throwing front door high sliders to Mookie Betts? Uh, it would be weird. Um, my assumption, just because of how hard that is to do, and I'm probably speaking for my own, this is my own bias, but like it's so hard to do that on purpose because the there's two the two misses are you hit them or it's right down the middle. And <laughs> you're used to burying stuff, trying to be nasty for swings and misses. And when that's your natural inclination, pull anything. If you're trying not to what give about up a damage, high and away you know, slider, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the high in the way slider where you're trying to get them to like, try to go out and just poke it like that yeah. could be like, not even like a cutter. Cause he doesn't have one, but he throws it. You can throw 87, 88. You can get it. Like he throws hard. a hard slider that a hard slider. you have more command of. It's not, so he's not trying to throw way. a high and away sweeper or something. He's trying to throw yeah. a high and away hard slider. It's maybe possible. I could, I could see that. But again, then again, you're like, it's an elevated slider. to move. Like, do I really want to mm. do that? You so, know that the commentator, the funniest thing is I, I, I sent the thing out about Tanner Bybee's uh, home run to Jan Collar Stanton. And it was like, oh, he hung a slider. I'm like, well, he missed his location by, you know, 10 inches. Yeah. Um, but the movement was this, was actually better than his average slider. So is that a hanging slider? It's just, you know, I think that, they, they, that, if you did that on purpose, slider. everyone said you hung a slider to Mookie Betts. You know, it's like, no, actually the game plan was – to throw a, a high slider is just Mookie's Mookie, you know? Mookie's Mookie. Uh, at the end of the day, Clay throws his slider and his sinker, so the movement is away from the middle of the zone. That right. is why he has those two pitches, and those two versions of his pitches are the ones that Mookie bets hammers. Right. So it's like, so does he change? Does he take a shot, like, to try to – Finesse one. That's what I'm saying. Is it desperate it. or smart if he, he does something? Totally he would different. have to be desperate, I think, especially with, you know, it's not like Clay's like, you know, pinpoint command. He's got good command, but it's not like you only throw that hard right. and it moves that much. You're, you're, you know, Zach Britton, you're not, you're not like painting constantly. Right, um, right. And, and so maybe he tries it because it's the World Series and scared money don't make money. But, <laughs> you know, I, I just don't think it's a great matchup, even though it's right on right. And it's going to be interesting to see. If Aaron Boone goes out there with like a yeah, because we got Clay Holmes and he throws a sinker and he throws a slider and it's a right on right matchup, and if he knows whether or not Mookie's like, mm. like that's my, I'm different. That's the stuff I love. I would rather a if he can weird stuff. And my you guess know? is if he can, he just tries to throw the more most extreme versions of those two that are basically out of the zone, and he basically walks Mookie. Let's. What did Otani just do? Why is Clay in the game right now? And is it in the middle of an inning? Is Odani on base? That'll change things too, right? Mm-hmm. Because and then if you're worried about Otani over there first, good luck, man. I, I I'm glad right, that I'm not he you. Might, he might be running watch. too, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's then you have him on second. You're like, now I really can't let Mookie hit anything because and and so then you're stuck. And both sides are gonna deal with this stuff. We're like, okay, Soto on. No, I got to face Judge. They're gonna mm-hmm. both have to do this. It's just gonna be a bunch of relievers holding their breath all game waiting to go in the game um so i i think the off i think there'll be a lot of offense in this series right i I think there'll be a lot of offense we've been talking about pitching the whole time but i i kind of feel like the average game is going to be like six five or something didn't the dodgers just score 10 runs in every single one of their wins except for the eight nothing so it was like (laughs) yeah yeah i mean i think the yankees staff is a little better than the Mets staff but but still but both teams are packed full of competent hitters that can do a lot of damage too so it's going to be a grind that's why we were focusing so much on the matchups and the bullpens throughout today's show we're going to go uh, on our way out the door just a reminder get a subscription to athletic for two dollars a month 
at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. You can join our Discord with the link in the show description. You can find us on Twitter. Trevor is at I am Trevor May. Eno is at Eno Saris. I am at Derek Van Riper. The pod is at rates and barrels. That is going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Thursday. Thanks for listening.